behalf of all faculty, staff, and students at the University of Northern Iowa, we want to thank Iowa City for your latest and greatest export, Ali for Ruth <laughs> A national celebrity, if you haven't seen it, he made the front page of the uh, Sports Illustrated today. So, uh, obviously, Cedar Falls is a flutter. I'm going to spend uh, just about 20, 25 minutes or so giving you a very quick and dirty introduction to some of the key uh, inflows of immigrants and refugees into the Midwest and into Iowa, and then talk very briefly about some of the uh, major uh, implications of these influxes and some of the key issues that face all of us in the business of trying to make this work. Please forgive me through, for flying through a lot of this. If there's a question that you actually can't wait to ask me, you're not going to throw me off stride and throw up a hand. You're welcome at any time to ask me a question. Or to pick a fight, go right ahead, or you can wait for my panelists to get up and pick a fight with them. That's, that's entirely up to you. I'm going to talk about two fundamental uh, processes that work in the Midwest and Iowa. Uh, these are going to sound like academies and professors speak, but they're going to be very clear to hear you here in just a minute. The two terms that we use to describe the demographic shifts in the Midwest today are these. One is called uh, rapid ethnic diversification. This simply refers to the process that a state or a region or a community or even a workplace goes through as it proceeds, as it transitions from being predominantly, if not exclusively, white and English speaking to being very multilingual. Uh, multicultural and multi-ethnic and all of that happening in a few short years. And the term microplurality, which we'll come back to here in just a few minutes, but again, it sounds like academies, but what it really refers to is some of the, is the tremendous diversity of newcomers that we kind of see coming into the state. If I had to set, set you up with one key notion about why all this is happening at once, we have a perfect demographic storm in Iowa right now. All of, the, in, all of the things that could be happening to fundamentally transform the state's demography are happening all at once. Some of those key ingredients are we have a rapidly aging white population right now, the largest single portion of the white population in the state are people 61 and older. Uh, we have very low for, lower fertility rates among white women than we do among non-white women. And that, of course, is exacerbated by the, by the fact that we lose half of our high school and college graduates throughout the state. In fact, statistically, uh, you and I graduates tend to be the most loyal. We only lose a third to other states. So we have we actually hemorrhage young people. Uh, we have higher birth rates among minorities in Iowa. And of course, throw it in the mix is and what keeps me busy over the last 20, 25 years, of course, has been this influx of immigrants, refugees, and other newcomers that do partly to labor shortage, but for some other reasons that I'll explain here. Uh, the, by far the largest single influx into the Midwest over the last uh, 15 to 20 years or so has been uh, Latino immigrants. The bulk of them are actually coming from Mexico. This graph shows you uh, that you can see it back through 1900 or so. The upper Midwest actually had relatively few Mexican immigrants per se. You see an uptick there in the 1930s, a couple of reasons for that, but that was mostly to build the railroads. In fact, historically, there's some, there are actually some interesting literature about the establishment of little tiny Mexican barrios and even small communities like uh, Mason City and Fort Dodge. Back about this time, and for the most part, they didn't last. There were really only the remnants that I know of, two left in the state, in Muscatine and Des Moines. But again, you can see that there are actually relatively few Mexican immigrants living in the upper Midwest right up until about 1970, 1980, and then it took off like a shot. And actually, this is based on census counts, so you can imagine, and, and, as, and I will insist actually that these are probably low, and, and the, the, the real numbers for the total number of Mexicans living in the Midwest is actually significantly higher than this. You can debate the, the absolute number, but the point here is the rapid growth. You can see that in the upper Midwest that the number of Mexican immigrants counted in the 1990 census was actually, uh, this is a very telling map, because you would expect, of course, as actually Guardian just showed you that map of the tremendous concentration of lots of immigrants who came to the United States, and it's to be expected through time, of course, that the vast majority of those folks are going to end up in cities, and that's still the case today. But what we see here in 1990 is, of course, that concentration of Mexican uh, immigrants living in places like Chicago, Des Moines, Kansas City, and so forth. And I want you please to notice all of the counties that have it that are uh, signified by this white color, which meant that in the 1990 census, there were supposedly no Mexicans living in those counties. Not one. Now, there may have been a couple and they missed them. But in terms of the census count, there were none. There were absolutely none. 
Notice, however, you had a fair number of counties that had less than 50, even in Iowa. And notice here at the top of that dark green color, which is uh, confined to the larger metropolitan areas, you had a top-in number of about 224,000. That was 1990. This is 2000. You have very few white counties that are, you know, that are indicated with a white. So you actually had a lot more counties that had lots more immigrants. And this is just the Mexicans. Okay? This doesn't count the other Latinos we'll discuss here in just a minute. And notice there are two significant things here. One is just how widespread the Mexican influx has been into the Midwest. It became a predominantly in our state, particularly a rural phenomenon. Although we still see tremendous growth in the Mexican population in Chicago, because you can see back in 1990, our upper end in our scale was 224,000. And now we're up to 400 and 430, and even that's probably low again because of the reluctance of undocumented folks to fill out census forms. So we had a, not only a tremendous growth in our Mexican populations, but also the dispersion of those folks. So everything is relative, of course, and not only did we see this tremendous influx of Mexicans and others, but we also started to see a a conversion where the white, the established resident, predominantly white populations are in decline and we're seeing growth in our immigrant, refugee, and newcomer populations. What this map shows you is the interplay between those two, between 2000 and 2007. You see we have four, basically four colors here. And this particular cartographer chose the term native. That doesn't mean necessarily mean Native American. That means someone, an established resident. It's just shorthand. It's just, you know, so it's just shorthand. It doesn't necessarily mean Native Americans. So if you have this yellow color, that meant that you had both growth in your established resident population and your immigrant population. If you have that dark green, and notice how much of that dark green is in Western Illinois, Minnesota, and Iowa, you actually had a decline in your established resident population and you had growth in your immigrant population. I did not tell you, I did not just tell you that there are more immigrants than locals. I didn't say that. But the ratios were, kind of, were beginning to change, and in some cases they changed quite dramatically. Uh, the yellow color, you had you get very few of those. You actually had more uh, native growth than immigrant growth. And then in the white, and there's still really two of those, you actually lost both. So you can see the interplay. And this is one of the reasons I keep so busy is because this, the dispersion of these newcomers is, is so very wide. Of course, in Iowa, the vast majority of the newcomers are Latinos. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the bulk of them, but not all, are actually uh, from Mexico. And we had a 2000 census count of 82,473 non-white Latinos, or non-white Hispanics, as the census counts them. This represented a growth rate of 153% since 1990. Most importantly is that uh, everyone was very relieved that the, pop the uh, state's population actually grew between 1990 and 2000, but what most people forgot is two-thirds of that was actually due to immigration. That has continued to today, and now what will be interesting when we see the results of the current census, and by the way, if you've done your census forms, please fill them out, all right, because it does matter, it does count. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, based on census estimates over the last 18 years, two-thirds of the state's total population growth has continued to be uh, because of immigration, again, predominantly, but not exclusively Latino. Uh, the 2008 census estimate for the number of non-white Hispanics in the state is about 124,000. I think that's low. I think it's closer to 130,000, but there are some people who think that I've gotten that wrong as well. That's probably low. Um, again, most of the Latinos are from Mexico, but you know, one of the myths that I'm constantly combating in my work and my training is that you've met one Latino, you've met them all. This is absolutely untrue. They're an extraordinarily heterogeneous group. In fact, the diversity among Latinos is, is absolutely tremendous. Uh, in the beginning, when I started working on this stuff, 1991, 92, 93, the vast majority of the Mexicans came from the big three sending states that you might expect from Guanajuato, Jalisco, and Michoacan. But now they're here from every state, all 31 states in Mexico, and of course, Mexico City. Also, we started to see a tremendous proliferation of folks from Central America, places like Guatemala, El Salvador, and other places. And of course, the folk, and we'll talk about Postal later, but you know, most of the folks who were ultimately uh, nabbed in the uh, May 2008 ice action of the Post War were actually Guatemalans. All right? But you can also see that we actually have lots of Latinos coming into the state from throughout Latin America. Relatively small numbers from some places like Peru and others, but they are starting to wander through. For many years, we've just expected Latinos from 
Latin, uh, South American in particular to be well-educated folks who would come in and work at the Rockwell Collinses and the John Deere's of the world, but now I'm starting to see indigenous folks from some of these other uh, uh, countries move in or wander through the state as well. And by the way, they don't all speak Spanish. Um, for a, a lot of them, a growing number of them, Spanish is not a first language. It may not even be a language that they learned as a child for lots of different reasons. Current projection for the size of the Hispanic population in the state. Uh, this is the projection that was made about three years ago for two, 2010. Already the census says we're past that. The current projection for 2030 is that in Iowa we're going to have 330,000 runaway Hispanics. Now remember the, key, the four key elements to a population projection are deaths, births, longevity, how long people live, and then the fourth fundamental key is what? Migration. And so the migration could be people leaving one place and going to another and vice versa. And so the real wild card in this projection is immigration. We get immigration reform, meaningful immigration reform, this number could be low. <coughs> We have a crackdown, the economy continues to, you know, to uh, not grow as much as we hoped that it would, then this number could be too high. But it's very difficult to say. So given that, and again, this is given current assumptions, please remember that current assumptions of a projection is only as good as the numbers you put into it in your assumptions. Iowa in 2030 is going to be 10% Latino and about 25% white people over 65. I work in counties in northwest Iowa right now where the median age in about five or six years is going to be 50. Half of all the people who live in those particular counties are going to be 50 or older. So we started to notice in Postville and other places, and a lot of people started asking this question, if employers are becoming very, very cautious about hiring Latinos because of enforcement immigration laws, uh, the, the new uh, E-Verify electronic database, and just some general caution among employers about hiring these folks, who are they turning to? And so we started to you know, sort of look at these sorts of things. And are we entering the post-Latino era? Well, and yes and no. What we are, what we do know is happening is that employers start to steer away for a lot of different reasons from hiring Latinos unless they can be absolutely sure they're eligible to work in the country. They're finding other people to take their places. And so what we're beginning to experience, and again, something else that keeps us very busy, is the fact that you have all these other new kind of very interesting people moving into our communities. Here's a partial list. We have second generation Hmong refugee kids from the Central Valley of California coming into Iowa. We have new, uh, <coughs> we have new waves of Vietnamese folks. We have Chinese people just kind of popping up in rural communities. I got a call, I forgot when it was, a month ago. Little school district I won't name, Chinese kids showed up. Fourth grade, didn't speak a word of English, neither did his parents. It's kind of popping up showing up from time to time. Of course, Bosnian refugees, large concentration in Wanlu and in Des Moines, and interestingly, what I'm doing on Friday, I think two days from now, is we're actually having a celebration of the anniversary of the 15th year of the arrival of Bosnian refugees into Iowa. Uh, Hasidic Jews in Postville, African refugees are arriving en masse. We have a very large concentration of Sudanese Muslims here in Iowa City. Des Moines now has the second largest concentration of Sudanese refugees in the country, second only to Omaha. But they're scattered around the state. We're seeing growing numbers of Sudanese refugees even in Storm Lake. There are about 200 and 225 Sudanese refugees in Storm Lake right now, and they speak nine different languages. We're starting to see growing numbers of Somalis. The Somalis tend to go to places where there's meatpacking jobs, but they're not going to cut up pigs for obvious reasons, so they're going to cut up poultry, they're going to cut up beef. Um, Pacific Islanders are kind of starting to come in droves from the nations of the Marshall Islands, Palau, and Micronesia. They travel, you know, six, 7,000 miles to come into Iowa to cut up animals. And the people are going, what, is, what on earth is going on here? Well, they've never leave the Central Pacific to come to the place in the uh, And the answer is very, very simple. They're being recruited. They're being recruited by the major employers, principally the Tysons of the world and some of the other major meat packing plants. And so we actually add to this thing that we call microplurality, where the Hispanics are a very large, discernible group, but now we have lots of these really interesting ethnically and linguistically distinct groups moving into the state, and they are coming here, and ever, I mean, almost every day I hear about a different kind of a group of people who are moving in. So very quickly, talk a little bit about some of the challenges associated with these influxes. Um, uh, one of the first, of course, that everybody thinks of, and it's been appropriate, is language. 
because you're going to have so many people come into the state who don't speak English or for whom English is a language that they're trying to learn. But not only do a lot of those folks come and not, especially the adults, don't speak English, but of course most adult Iowans, and even all Iowans generally, uh, don't speak Spanish, much less Dinka or Karen or Creole or the dozens of other languages that are now appearing in the state. And of course, I get yelled at all the time, you know, why don't they learn English? What the hell's wrong with those people? They, they're gonna live here, they're gonna learn English. And, you know, learning English as an adult is very difficult. It takes a lot of time, and it's always gonna be second to work and family. And here's the dirty little secret. Their employers don't want them to learn English. Because they learn English, they can go off and get a better job. So language is a significant barrier. We talk about the challenges for established residents. We're always very honest up front about the challenges. You know, this is a difficult thing when you have a community that used to be predominantly English speaking, then it becomes very multilingual, and a lot of this happens in a few short years. This is difficult. You are, if you're not honest about the challenges up front, then you are usually discredited. Changing from predominantly, if not exclusively white and English speaking, to being very multi ethnic, being very multilingual, in some cases multi religious. And interestingly, for the most part, the newcomers and their micropolarity and ethnic diversification are not coming from European nations. There are, of course, a handful of exceptions to that. Um, another difficult thing for people, particularly in rural areas, but in some of the smaller cities as well, is the recognition that in the 70s and 80s and well into the 90s, we lost a lot of manufacturing jobs to other countries, offshoring jobs, and for me, symbolically, the last nail in the coffin is when Ertl Farm Toys left Dyersville. Okay, a lot of, hundreds of, hundreds of uh, Iowa-based employers pulled out and moved to places like Mexico and China and so forth. But for me, symbolically, the last nail in the coffin was Ertl Farm Toys leaving Dyersville. And Iowans began, and this is stung, you know, Iowans are still kind of reeling from this, and then they began to realize that they were competing not for jobs, not just with their neighbors and the people down the road, but for people literally around the world. And they ask themselves a very fundamental question, uh, what have we done? So they now find themselves part of a global labor market, and this is a very difficult thing for a lot of people. And when I talk about rapid ethnic diversification, I am talking about some communities in which, the, in which the massive arrival of newcomers has actually taken place in a three to five year period. That's fast. Sociologically, anthropologically, historically, that is the wing of that. Um, just a couple other key issues. We talk a lot about stereotypes. We talk a lot about you know, people say, well, we don't want to stereotype this about this. And we always try to operationalize this. And it's ironic. I just came here from doing a training at John Deere up in uh, Waterloo, where we have to help them try to distinguish between a generalization, which is kind of a statistically valid way, uh, way of describing a characteristic of a population versus a stereotype. And the way that we operationalize it basically is a generalization is something you can back up with numbers, right? But as soon as you make uh, that the assumption, that assumption about a group, a group characteristic for an individual member of that group, then you have to stereotype that person. And what's become very, very interesting, particularly in, in the training that I do for law enforcement, is how you navigate these very treacherous <coughs> waters where at first you have Latinos who spoke Spanish and then you have Latinos who didn't speak Spanish. Right? And then you start to see all these other folks come in, and you know, you're getting pretty good at kind of the greetings and tell, you know, asking people the perfect questions in Spanish, and then they have all these other languages come in, plus all the other ethnicities, national origins, refugee, uh, immigration status, and so forth. Uh, if I had to, you know, if I had to point to another critical lesson, a lot of people will say, excuse my ignorance, I have an ignorant question, I fire right back immediately, there is no such thing as ignorance. We are uninformed or we are misinformed. And when it comes to immigrants and refugees, we are usually both. Uninformed means that there's a lot of things that we just don't know about. A lot of things we've never learned. A lot of things that's very difficult to kind of get that information. A lot of us just don't have the time to go look up Micronesia and find out how many languages there are in Micronesia. There's busy people. That's being un uninformed. Being misinformed is when people tell us deliberate untruths about immigrants and refugees. And heaven knows. There are a lot of them. And so it's very, very interesting when you try to get people in a church basement or in a, or in a work site, you know, a workplace or a school district or a police force to kind of 
think, well, if you're uninformed, you can still learn. But if you're misinformed, then you have to be, then you have to relearn what you've heard. And so many assumptions out there that it is simply based on the fact that people don't know or they've been misled. Uh, finally, if you think, you know, I've been asked, how do people respond to the newcomers? What are the critical issues? Isn't there a lot of conflict? Aren't there rumbles in the street? I mean, you know, I mean, you get this stuff, and aren't there people fighting all the time? Is it rather ugly? And, and for the most part, I gotta tell you, no. That a lot of the dire predictions for carnage in the streets and rapidly rising crime rates, for the most part, that stuff has not really come true. There are challenges. You know, I'm not Pollyanna, I'm not gonna tell you, you know, everything is wonderful. But generally speaking, the populations uh, that I work with come into three different categories, like the 2060-20 rule. And this, of course, is very flexible. 20% of the population is already accepting of newcomers. To them, this is a good thing. They're already convinced that, this, that the arrival of these folks in their workplaces, in their, in their uh, churches, in their schools, in their communities is a good thing. This is an OK thing. They may be very active, or they may be very passive. They may be very active in terms of being a tutor for an ESL class. They may be very, very passive by just being very comfortable letting their kids play with their kids and so forth. They're what I call the choir. I don't need to try to convince them that this is a good thing. They're already convinced themselves. The other end of the spectrum, the 20% of the population, I call you know, you know, very, you know, very uh, scholarly uh, title. I just call them knuckleheads. Okay. And there is nothing that you, I, or God Almighty can ever do to convince them that this is a good thing. They've already convinced themselves, or they have been convinced by a number of sources in the media that the arrival of immigrants and refugees is a bad thing, and, I'm, and I cannot convince them otherwise. And so I don't try. I don't buy. There are people, I work with people in this business who really believe that you can change how you can change those people, and I don't bother. They're, they're narcoheads, they're going to be narcoheads, I'm not going to waste my energy on them. My target audience is that big 60% in the middle of people who just aren't sure. This is new, there are challenges associated with it, this is very different from their experience. You know, they're still learning, they have an awful lot of questions. They might, and again, when I work with these kind of populations, my, my fundamental goal is to get them to the pl place where they can ask themselves about their assumptions and what their assumptions are about newcomers, and if they really do have questions, it's okay to ask. Now, uh, just a minute. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, they, a lot of the uh, discussion about immigration and the arrival of refugees and other newcomers into our communities, and even to you know, relatively cosmopolitan places like Iowa City and Cedar Rapids, is that a lot of the discussion gets clouded by a more general uh, conversation about what diversity is. And my advice is to assume absolutely nothing. But well, at a very telling moment in my career, there was a town, that, and I, I'm not making this up, that decided it was too white, they wanted diversity, they called me in, they closed the door, I made sure the press wasn't there, and I said, you guys want diversity? Yeah, we want diversity. Are you sure you want diversity? We want diversity, help us get it. I made them all pull out a piece of paper, write down, write down their own definition, their personal definition of diversity. There are 30 people in the room, but how many definitions of diversity did we find? 30. They all had just assumed that everybody else knew what the rest of them were talking about. This is very, very, very you have to be very, very careful about this because the term diversity in and of itself lacks tremendous consistency and, every, and the, it has become such a cliche that a lot of people have simply assumed that when you talk about it, it must be a good thing because everybody else agrees that it is got it, you put the cart way before the horse. Um, how people define diversity is going to be, uh, it's going to change dramatically by their own backgrounds, their own culture, their immigration status, their relationship to power, uh, how, how, they're, how they're making a living, their own linguistic background, okay, their willingness to accept, tolerate other people. The term diversity has become such a cliche that it's actually overshadowing the hard work that it takes to make these and I do, you know, like I, Mark Gray trains the Iowa State Patrol because the last guy who did it blew in and called them all racist. Second sentence out of his mouth was, well, you guys are all racist and you belong to a racist institution. What do human beings do when they're called names? They shut down. So you have to understand that there is, you've got to get past the point of political correctness. You've got to get past this notion that everybody values and loves diversity and can get down to the hard work of actually making these work. So my final recommendation then is to get past this relatively stagnant notion of 
diversity for diversity's sake. That the assumption that in and of itself it's a good thing. And you know what? It can be a wonderful thing. It can be great. It can strengthen our communities, our workforces, you know, our workplaces. It can do wonderful things. Diversity can be a great thing. But really what we need to focus on is not the perspective that, hey, we've got five African-American employees and we've got three Hispanic employees. We have diversity. What we really need to think about as we put everything we do in an anthropological and a historic context is really think about the process of diversification, which understands that we came from someplace and that we're going someplace else, and we're just in the middle. We, came, we have a history, we have a future, and we're undergoing the process right now of diversification. And what that does is it places our experience within a broader context, not only history, the economy, you know, or what are our goals as a community, as a workforce, and, and of course, understanding how you know, fundamental shifts in labor markets, which as the arrival of these newcomers has clearly indicated to us, even in the most, most remote rural Iowa community, those residents find themselves participating in an international, the global labor market. That's, and that's my setup for our wonderful panel.